very, very excited and it's an honor for me to be here. I'm Dario Sanchez, as you mentioned, I'm working in emphasis already for a few months. And today I'm gonna to talk about the precision phenotyping and the importance of um, crop science uh, lines and to see how the pollen viability is important for have a better um, crop performance. So regarding emphasis, it has been a very fruitful year for our company, not only because we launched the new P20, but also because we have several projects all around the world with new applications. Um, and with this, let's get started. So being known that the global population is said to be 10 billion by 2050, we need to double the production of uh, crops or the food to be able to feed the entire population. In this way, we need to do it in a sustainable and efficient and in a cost effective way. Um, moreover, not only because like the population is growing, but also because we know climate change is affecting um, the agriculture and how the crops are responding to this, it varies depending on the country. So we have seen how the different technologies are applying to have a better agricultural crop uh, performance and how to actually have a better um, resources. So in this sense, we have vertical farms, artificial pollination, autonomous pickers, laser wake killers, which detect what are the weeds that need to be uh, removed. We also have these micro sensors, which detect how is the best moment for a plant to be, um, uh, if the plant is, is affected by a pathogen or if the plant needs to be harvested. So keeping in mind this, um, as humans, we have been always selecting in the past what are the best traits to promote agriculture and to have a better deal. So let me tell you, for example, in this case, we have in tomato how in the last 2000 years, humans have been select selecting for um, a better uh, deal. Let's say, for example, to have a better um, tomato, bigger tomatoes with a better taste, also like the stronger flavor or certain, um, certain color of the fruit. But not also the fruit, but also like, for example, the resistance of the plant against pathogens. This includes viruses, bacteria, um, and, and, and pathogens and, and fungi. So we have been selecting these different plants which are more resistant against these pathogens. And through this selection, we have been also like making sure that we select or we, we keep the, the right plants. But not only resistance and the crop deal, we also have these adaptive traits, which means like those plants who are, able to, who are able to adapt to different conditions when the climate change. So for example, let's say that we have a plant growing in the desert and it creates these longer roots to be able to collect more water. So the capacity to be able to develop longer roots is what we call adaptive traits and not all the plants are able to do it. But now let's focus on the pollen and how phenotyping the pollen is also a trait that is important for agriculture and to have a better crop. So in this case, we can look at how viable is the pollen, whether some genotypes on some lines, they produce a better quality of the pollen, whether this pollen has the right concentration or whether there is a high number of aberrant cells. Let me tell you, aberrant cells are the cells that are not mature or didn't reach the mature state and therefore um, is not viable neither. So keeping in mind this, we have this huge amount of traits, which always have been always a fact that you must try to select through the several, several years. And in this sense, pollen quality is what I'm gonna talk about. So let me tell you now that I tell you what is application or the, um, the, the importance of the crop of the trades, let me tell you about the technology. So in this case, um, our technology is based on impedance flow cytometry, which um, is revolutionizing the breeding, the research and the production market. So how does, what is the core of the technology or how our technology works? So we have this microfluidic chip. What it does is um, it creates this, um, it has like a tunnel where the cells of the pollen goes through and there are these two electrodes and these electrodes create an electrical field that are able to count and also to test based on the properties of the cells, whether the cells are viable or whether the cells are dead. 
So this is what we call the impedance flow cytometry, and this is the technology behind um, our instrument and how we actually assess the pollen and why it's so important because like the traditional methods, it was the germination assays, and in this case are very, very quick and very robust results. The technology um, is the microchip and the, the, the core of the technology is the microchip, but then this is the instrument. So we have so far these two instruments. This is the Amphacet 32 and the P20. This is something that my colleague Georg will talk about later in the presentation after me. And about applications, as I mentioned, this is the main core of our applications. Like this is the pollen phenotyping and how it's important to assess the pollen viability and the pollen quality. Not only pollen, we always, so we are super focused on agriculture, but we also look at the life science, bioprocessing agriculture, uh, and so on. This means like we've also test for um, human cells, uh, bacteria, and as I mentioned, we are mostly focusing on agriculture and we have this more than 250 crops that we assess already. So now that I explain a little bit about the technology and about the instruments, let me show you how the data looks like. So this is what we call the scatter plot. And here in the X axis, we have the phase and the Y axis, we have the amplitude. So based on these two axes, we can uh, have an idea how the viable pollen looks like. In this case, each, each uh, point in the scatter plot is a pollen grain. So everything that is on the right side of the scatter plot is what we call, what we call the viable pollen, and on the left side is the non-viable pollen. As you can see in the scatter plot, we have in this case for this tomato genotype, the 73% of the total pollen was viable, and we assess about 15,000 cells. So this is just to give you an idea how the technology works and how does the data looks like. Now that we know about the technology and the information behind, let me tell you about the applications. So the applications go from pollen viability to pollen counting, pollen concentration, the fraction of fibrin cells, the pollen ploidy, and the microspore developmental stages. I will focus and I will explain more in each slide about these different applications. But I just want to make sure that um, we know pollination is an important phenomenon in nature we see how pollinators carrying the pollen from flower to flower are the key main uh, process to guarantee to have a, a, a deal or to have a, a fruit or a crop. Uh, however, we need to also focus on the viability of this pollen. Not all the pollen is viable and not all the pollen has the right amount to be able to pollinate a different flower. So among the applications, we can categorize them in different in four different um, folders. So we can go from research. And in here, we I will explain mostly these first two examples about how climate change affects pollen, how the pollen viability varies depending on the climate, and how microspore state determination is also part of this uh, research field and we can access it with the, with the technology we have. In breeding, we have, for example, the pollen ploid and the line phenotyping. I will focus more and I will explain specific details or specific cases later on. But another category we have is the production research, how to optimize, for, for example, the pollination, how abiotic factors affect the plant growth, and how pollen preservation, how to optimize this pollen preservation, how to actually look at these right uh, conditions to store the pollen. And in the production, we can uh, talk about the routine pollen quality control and how pollen quality storage and transportation and the surveillance of this pollen stock. So now let's get started with the first example. This is into research and how climate change affects um, pollen viability. In this example, I'm going to talk about tomato crops and how do they respond to heat stress. So I'm just going to show you a scatter plot as the one that I saw before. And see, we can see here we can see how the viability pollen is on the right, this right cloud here, as I'm pointing with the mouse. This is the mature and viable pollen. And here on the left side, we have the, the dead mature pollen. However, below this red line, we have the aberrant pollen. As I mentioned before, aberrant pollen is unmature pollen that it didn't then reach the category of mature, right? so therefore it's not viable. In this case, we have seen that how the aberrant pollen is highly affected by heat stress. 
So there is a high percentage of aberrant pollen produced by the plants when there is a heat, um, a heat phenomenon or the plants are stressed by the heat. Um, among the benefits when we use the technology to understand why this aberrant pollen is higher is we can select these more tolerant or resistant lines of tomato against heat, for example. There is also this correlation we have seen before, we have seen before between pollen viability and also fruit uh, um, the crop production. So there is this correlation between pollen viability and seed set. So this means that we can also predict how much seed set um, based on the pollen viability that the line produce. But also the third uh, aspect that we can consider as a benefit is understand how pollen viability, um, oh, sorry, this is what I said before. This is uh, the example that I mentioned, how to predict the, the seed set based on the, based on the pollen viability. Um, moreover, uh, Martin Jansen in the last presentation of today will talk about more about heat stress and how pollen viability varies. Now, I'm going to the second example about microspore stage determination. And this is how uh, the wheat microspores vary along the spike. And what I'm seeing here in the scatter plot is again the phase in the X axis and the Y in the amplitude and the Y axis. And here we overlay the different lines or the different stages of microspores and we put them in a different colors. So we can see how the first early nucleate um, cells of the, of the microspores occupy a very low amplitude in the, in the graph and middle phase, like around two, uh, 250. Then when the cell grows, it shape it shifts to the left to have a, like a lower phase and a slightly bigger, uh, higher amplitude. This, when the cells grow and, and becomes binucleate, it goes all the way to the right to a higher phase and a slightly higher amplitude. And this leads to the tree nucleate, which is actually the one most of the corner with the highest amplitude and the highest phase. But we also have when finally the cell became a mature pollen, which is shift all the way to the left in the phase and has the highest amplitude. So as we can see, not only the pollen quality can be measured, but also the developmental stages of the microspores. So what are the benefits? So here, our technology can be used to understand more about the microspore stage determination. We can also look at the bulb of the spike uh, of, the, of the wheat and make selection for double applied protocols. In this sense, having this application and having this data, we can also have a better idea how the embryo generation will be based on the microspores. Um, all I didn't mention, but um, Federica, my colleague Federica tomorrow will talk about the microspore states more in detail in case you are, you are interested as well. Now regarding to breeding, uh, as I mentioned, we have these research examples, now I'm focusing on breeding. So here I'm gonna talk about the pollen ploidy determination. And in this case, I found it very particular interesting how watermelon seedless fruits are made. So let me tell you, if you are not familiar with uh, watermelon seedless, um, they are uh, tree ploid. So how we get these tree ploid cells from watermelon to be seedless. So we have this female tetraploid that we mix it with, a, or we fecundate it with a male tree, um, diploid. So we get the offspring of a triploid um, watermelon, which actually have this seedless. So over the last 2000 years, we have been selecting uh, watermelons to be bigger, to be sweeter in, in the flavor, and also to have um, a better juice or uh, have a, a, a better consistency. But in this case, the way that we obtain the seedless watermelon is a different way, as I said, it based on the ploidy. So based on the technology, we can actually look at how the different genotypes that we have, how, what is the ploidy of these lines? Are they like diploid or are they tetaploid? So having this information allow us to have um, a identification of this ploidy of the different lines. And um, at the end, we can also do this phenotyping and look at the different varieties of watermelons that we have and to select those ones that we are interested to cross with and to have a better cross efficiency and yield prediction. At the end, if we are interested in the seedless watermelon, we can select these two different ones 
that are important for, for the market. And um, we obtain these three ployed watermelon seedless fruits. The second example that I wanted to talk about is um, chickpeas and how um, this, this was a problem for our customer that um, the cross access of the chickpeas between the different lines it was very low. So we were wondering whether there was a problem with the pollen viability in this sense, like whether the pollen viability is very low or the concentration is very low to make a cross success to be able to breed the different lines. So what we have seen here using the technology is that actually the different lines, they had a very good viability um, of the pollen. Like mostly all of them, they were above 50%. However, we have seen that aberrant pollen vary between the different lines. Some of the lines they have higher aberrant pollen than other ones. However, we didn't see that that was the issue neither for the cross uh, pollination. It seems like in this case, there is a very low um, cross success between the different lines because they are uh, inbreeding the prey. So they, they are, the genetically is not able to cross these two different lines and therefore the cross doesn't work. But with this, with this, uh, with the technology, we were able to actually answer the question why the the, um, the cross didn't work. Is the problem of the pollen? We were able to say like, no, that was not the able of the pollen. But we are able to say whether well, the selection of this good genotypes making less concentration of less number of aberrant pollen to optimize the cross success between these two different um, genotypes that we're interested and to. Um, half a better pollen quality in hybrid production. Now we dive into the production research. And here I wanted to talk about the optimization of pollination, how it's important to optimize and to, um, to make a better pollination to guarantee uh, a crop yield. In this sense, I'm talking about corn pollen quantity and the synchronization of flowering. So, here, what we did, we were interested to see when is the best time for harvesting the pollen to make uh, to to uh, for flowering. So, we were wondering how the, during the flowering time of corn is the highest peak of concentration of pollen. So, here in the x-axis we see the number of days of the year, and here on the y-axis we see the total amount of pollen shed per hour. And per, per trap. So we were having these traps in the field, collecting the pollen from the corn, and we were seeing, assessing per hour, how the viability or how, sorry, how the concentration of pollen varies along the days. So we have seen like seven days after the first flower flower, after the first um, flower opens, uh, it was the highest peak of the concentration of pollen made. So with this information, we can actually synchronize female and male flowers to be able to flower at the same time by determining determine the right time for germination or to actually sow the seeds to be able to kind of like compensate the differences in time for flowering between males and females. So in this, uh, in this case, one of the benefits as well is to optimize the manual pollination. So we know when is the best time for harvest the pollen and we can um, have the better time for cross uh, pollinate these male and females. The second example in the production research I wanted to talk is about the impact of abiotic factors in plant growth. In this case, I was interested to see how the production of mangoes in Australia was this year and the last few years specifically very low. So we have seen um, this data belongs to the um, um, to the research institution of uh, in Australia, which uh, predicted how the temperature is going to rise in the next 50 years in the country. So there are different models and these are different predictions. But overall, it is estimated that there is an increase of four degrees in the north of Australia, where the mangoes, where there is a big field of mangoes producing. So I was wondering, what is the problem for the mango production? and why the mango production is so low in the north of, in the north of Australia. Uh, with our customer, we were wondering uh, whether the pollen viability is correlated with the production of mangoes. So we have seen how uh, there are different uh, production of pollen viability depending on the lines and how the, 
precipitation or the temperature is affecting the uh, production of this pollen, like how the pollen quality varies depending on the temperature or how the pollen vi uh, quality varies depending on the precipitation of the region. So with this information, when we are able to look at how the pollen viability looks like, we're able to select these more resistant genotypes of mangoes against heat, for example. We are also able to optimize the efficiency of crosses. So if we are, if we are interested to make a cross between two different genotypes or two different lines, we can be able to know who are the best pollen to make the cross with. And of course, at the end, we can optimize the production of mangoes to have a better, a better deal. Now we dive into the last um, category, which is the production. And here I want to talk about the routine pollen quality control in pepper production. So here in this graph, we can see in the x-axis the different stages in a category of the flower. So the first one is a closed bud. This means like with the, with the flower is still closed. The next one, the bell flower, is when the flower is already opening. And the third category is like the, when the flower is fully open. So we see in the y-axis uh, the mature pollen viability, how varies from 20% almost in the closed bud to 45% in open flowers. So having this information also allows us to optimize the pollen collection. So if we know that the pollen uh, viability, it increases when the flower is open, we have this better selection of the timing for the collection of the pollen. In this sense, we can increase the success of the cross-pollination between the different lines of pepper. So let's say that we are interested in to, to cross to different lines. So we select the right moment to pick up the pollen to make the cross with. And of course, at the end, the benefit of having this information is to increase and to have a better production. Now, I'm gonna tell you about the last example that I'm gonna to talk today and is the pollen quality control storage of transportation in tomato pollen. So we have seen how our customers and how we are interested to test how the pollen viability varies along the supply chain. This includes like how the viability of the pollen it is after collection. This is what we, I explained it before, like how in all the different examples, we look at the viability of the pollen after collection. This information is very important, as I explained before, but it's also interesting to see how this viability of the pollen varies through the chain. So how uh, the pollen viability varies before preservation or after preservation, whether we ship this pollen, let's say from Switzerland to Germany, how during this transportation, this viability pollen also varies and how it decreases when it reaches the final uh, field for, for cross-pollination. And of course, we can also keep a, keep a track how the viability uh, is just right before making the cross. So one of the most important uh, aspects of the technology is to keep a track how the viability or how the quality of the pollen varies along the chain and to optimize the storage and transportation conditions to promote the, to have a better deal at the end. So as a conclusion, I want to highlight um, that we do or we focus in this pollen phenotyping to understand how the viability of the pollen varies, how the concentration and the amount of pollen is produced per different lines, what is the percentage or what is the fraction of aberrant cells, but we go beyond that. We only not focus in pollen, but we also are able to test for microspore stage development and also the ploidy of the cells. Among the applications, I mentioned several examples, and we go all the way from line phenotyping to test which ones are the lines that are more resistant to abiotic factors, especially now with the current climate change, how the, to optimize the flowering period, like how to be able to make a success cross between males and females to be able to have a better crop yield. And at the end, to keep a track how the pollen viability or how the pollen quality varies along this routine check or to the supply chain in in sense of like when we are shipping or storing in the pollen. So our technology, I not focusing that much in how it works, but um, my colleague will talk about it later in, my, in the presentation. And it's very fast, very easy to use and very accurate because at the end it includes all the sample size that we have. And this is more like up to 10,000 different cells. So at the end with this information, 
we have a better, better idea of what are, the, what are the decisions that we need to make with our crops on how to optimize the different, the different aspects regarding the yield or regarding the production of a, of a certain, certain uh, field. So with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention and please feel free to ask any questions regarding the presentation. Me and Gorka are gonna be very happy to help you and to answer all your questions. Thank you very much, Dario, for such a nice presentation. I have to say that all our attendees have been really, really active during your talk. We have plenty of questions and we will try to answer uh, most of them. So with that, I would like to start with the first one, which says, how do I gate or how do I know where to set the gating to differentiate viable pollen and non-viable pollen? Dario? Mm -hmm. So I answer this question. Let me go for um, this slide. So how do we gate, how do we know where is viable and what is the dead pollen? So I didn't go in detail, but here we can see, as I said, every dot is a, is a pollen grain. So based on the instagrams in the face and the instagrams in the aptitude, we see how here there is a little bump, then it goes down, and then it increases again. So based on these histograms here, we see this drop in, um, in the histogram, which allow us to put the gate in that, in that line. So everything that is on the left side of this line is considered dead pollen, and everything that is on the right side is the viable pollen. Perfect, thank you very much, Dario. Um, another question says like, what kind of pollen can be analyzed? All crops? In here, I would say that yes, uh, our technology would be able to analyze uh, most of the pollen available. And in case you have any question, I would recommend to, um, to check in our web page. You can download a tin table, a tin table with all the pollen that it has been tested by us. Also, you can directly contact Dario or me uh, with a more specific um, question, or you can send an email to info at emphasis.com. We will try to solve your inquiry as soon as possible. Let me check and look for other different questions. Maybe, yeah, as pollen has different sizes, how can be that all pollen is analyzed? Are, are there different chips? Okay, I see that this is this question is related to the to the to the previous one. So yes, I would say that for measuring the different pollens, what you would need is a specific chip. As well, in this template, you can download and you can check or look for um, or ask us directly, both to Dario or Gorka, and we will try to adjust which kind of chip and also which kind of buffer you would need uh, for your specific crop of interest. Mm. This one may be for you, Dario. Mm -hmm. You all only mentioned crops and small vegetables. Can you also measure pollen from trees? Yeah, indeed. Uh, one of the examples was some mango pollen, so that's actually a tree. Yeah, um, it's true that I focus mostly on tomato, wheat, or corn. But we can, we are able to measure any kind of pollen. As Gorka said before, we have up to more than 250 different crops that we, or uh, different species of plants that we assess the pollen viability of the pollen concentration. So this includes apple trees, mango trees, avocados, uh, almond trees. And of course, like, as I said, like we are focusing on agriculture and we are um, having specialized in the pollen, but we also are able to measure bacteria and uh, fermentations. Thank you very much. Yes, I would say that also eucalyptus, pine pollen, uh, all the different kind of trees that have analyzed and we, we the system works perfectly with them. Um, this one is a really interesting question that uh, maybe you, you can solve for us, Dario. Is mm -hmm. aberrant pollen more influenced by genetics or environment? E example, high heat. Is mm -hmm. it consistent across crops? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, this is a very interesting question. I I believe that this is more correlated with the environment. I, I, we have seen that how, for example, this heat stress in tomato produce uh, these lines to have a higher percentage or higher concentration of aberrant cells. So um, this is, uh, of course, I think like there is two factors. At the end, this is what we call phenotype, right? Like the genotype, like this is what the genes have and also the environment. And at the end, both of them, like the genotype and the, and the environment, they play a role in the production of pollen. So I think there is both aspects affect the aberrant, aberrant cells production. Like we see how the aberrant cells um, increase based on the heat stress, but also we have seen with chickpeas, for example, how the different lines of chickpeas being in the same environment, they produce also different, with a different amount of aberrant cells. So answering, I don't know if it's answered the question or not, but I think actually both of them, both aspects are correlated with aberrant cells. Perfect, thank you very much, Daria. Uh, I see that there are a lot of questions in this direction, so maybe I will reply it quickly. Is there a way to make several measurements at a time? Yes, I would say that yes. Uh, together with the Z32, we offer an auto sample that allows you to measure up to 96 samples in a fast time. So um, I would recommend if you have a lot of work to also uh, send us an email and maybe we can adjust those kind of experiments more for you. Um, and this one is interested also, can I measure pollen in the field or only in the lab? Do you want me to answer this question? Yes, please. Um, well, we are able to measure the pollen. So this instrument, the set 32 the one that we see in the image, is mostly, let's say, focused to work in the lab. Uh, but we are also able to carry field measurements. And this is actually with a new technology, the P20, with my colleague Jörg, we talk about this in the next presentation. So these two instruments, they, they do the same. The, the base of the technology is indeed on flow cytometry and we get the same or similar information. But it's true like the applications in the field, um, they vary a little bit. So to carry field measurements um, is better to do it with the P20 because it's much more user-friendly and because it has the rechargeable batteries which allows you to carry several examples or several, to work in the field for like up to four hours We've been, um, we've been worried about the, the batteries or about the energy power. So answering the question, yes, we were able to measure field analysis and, and of course in the lab and in the greenhouse. Perfect, thank you very much, Daria. I see also a lot of um, questions in focusing more in microspore analysis. Uh, for double haploid production, like how do you know the stage of the microspore, which the stage unicellulate, binucleate, and compare with other methods or not? Uh, for that, I would say that our system allows to differentiate most uh, all the nucleate state. Um, Dario has already spoken about it. Also, I would like to remind you that uh, our colleague Federica will give a specific talk just about this topic tomorrow, accelerating double uploads for plant production that you, you can register for there. That will be more specific in order to um, better understand how our technology can help in the production of double, uh, double uploads. But maybe, Dario, you can give us a little bit of Mm -hmm. More yeah, information. So based, based on that question, how do we know when is the stage of the microspore? So as I said, we all the information we have is based on the phase of the scatter plot and in the amplitude. So as I said in the presentation, like based on the stage of the microspore, it occupies a different position in the scatter plot. So the early nucleates occupy normally this very low amplitude, and then when the cell grows, it shifts into the left side which it goes into like a lower phase and it's still a very low amplitude. When there is finally three nucleate or mature pollen, this shifts all the way to highest amplitude. So we identify the three nucleate on the right side, on the corner here, as you can see, um, with the high phase and the high amplitude. And then the mature pollen, when it's fully mature or ready to, 
to pollinate, it shifts into the left to having a lower phase. Um, as Gorka said, like Federica will talk about more about microspores and, and in detail about this topic. But uh, I think in general we can see this is at the end an overlay, an overlap of the different of the different microspore stages. So that's why how this is how we see how they all develop in the different in the different position in the scatter plot. Exactly. Thank you very much, Dario. We all know that this is a hot topic, and I really recommend to sign up for Federica as well. All these questions will be explained more in detail. Um, another question uh, um, says like this, in the P experiment, the conclusion was that the lines with lower aberrant cells resulting in higher seed set, Dario? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I didn't get it. Like, do you mean the one for tomato with the she set and the and the pollen viability? No, the one with the chickpeas. I with the chickpeas. Um, the question was the conclusion was that the lines with lower aberrant cells result in, in higher seed set. We don't know that. We we didn't go further. So in these examples that I explained are some of them are current current topics that we are working on it. And we cannot um, we cannot see whether this is correlated with seed set. Um, we know in chickpeas uh, the fruit development it includes normally between two or three chickpeas inside. So I think um, I mean we don't have the information now to make such a conclusion. But I think um, normally the number of fruit of the seeds produced per fruit I will say is not um, highly correlated with the aberrant cells production um, but as i said this is this is information that we don't know this is this needs to be tested in more detail we didn't count for example for the number of seeds produced by chickpeas hello guys sorry to interrupt but we have time for two more questions okay <laughs> um maybe the next one is for me is there any difference between the quality of pollen in the morning and the afternoon this is a really interesting, really, really interesting question. I would say that maybe there is an effect in quantity because after the day you can lose um, pollen and also pollen viability. But I would recommend to really um, give it a try with our instrument for the future and check that because it's a really interesting, uh, a really interesting question, and I believe. And we all believe that there is an effect on time for pollen viability and also for the number of pollen. So, and luckily, I don't know that answer, but I would recommend to do that experiment. Dario, maybe you have any... I want to say that it's actually true, like the, the, the pollen concentration actually of the pollen amount produced by a flower actually varies along the day. Um, it has been seen that normally in the early morning around eight or nine, the pollen is still during the night because of the night before it's still like cold and it's kind of like, it's still um, very dense and it didn't mature. And it's known that the first light or the first uh, warm up of the temperature of the day actually helps to release the pollen, the mature pollen. So we can, I mean, um, I, don't, I cannot say in general, you know, the crops, but I think it is known that the pollen viability or the pollen concentration of mature pollen varies along the day. And it's mostly during the midday when it's actually the highest. But as I said, this is not a general, this is a general statement, but not specific for each crop. For sure. And that can affect also the viability. So I would recommend it to give it a try and mm -hmm. with our instrument. Um, so just for finishing, um, last question. Um, how many um, how many plants do you think that you that are needed for a reliable pollen data? For a line analysis. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is interesting, and I think this is something that we need to learn from from trying. I think at the end it's hard to say a number like one hundred or two hundred. We have been working with the P twenty, and we, for example, developed these chips which are intelligent and they are specific for each group. We did many, many, many measurements per line for so many different lines, so many measurements, and also at the different times per day. So at the end, it's hard to answer this question. I think at the end, it depends of what is your capacity to, to run an analysis and what is the capacity of you, your field, let's say. Like, 
if you have few lines, it's easier to, to do more analysis to have a better idea. Of course, as many as you do, a more robust conclusion you can draw. Um, it's hard, I guess it's hard to, for me to answer this question. I think like, I would say minimum 100 samples exactly. per line. Thank you, Ariel. I think that we can agree that um, with our technology, which is really fast, allows you to measure more samples than with traditional methods. And that is the key. And that allows you also to increase their numbers for decreasing the error, for example. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dario, for the amazing presentation. And also, thank you, Gorka, for the nice talk. And thanks to the audience for uh, being here today and also for the interesting questions that we have received. Don't worry if we didn't reply all your questions. You will receive an email with the answer. And also, uh, I want to remind that this session has been recorded. So you will receive in the next 24 hours a link, and then you can download the session. You can watch it again, or you can share with colleagues that couldn't attend today to this talk. Also, it will help us uh, a lot because you will receive now a questionnaire. If you can take two minutes to answer it, it will help us to improve for the future. And if you have more questions, please send an email to info at emphasis.com. We will be very glad to help you. Now we will finish this session, but I want to invite you for the next one. In the next one, we will be talking about our next, uh, about our new instrument, the P20. So we will be very happy if you also join. I remind you that every, every one of these six sessions is in a separate Zoom webinar. So we will be closing this one and opening another one. If you have not registered, don't worry. You still have time. You just go to our website and just a couple of clicks, you will receive the link for the next session. So thank you again, guys, and see you in the next webinar. Thank you.